During the month of June, we are going to focus on um, leading up to June the 25th, which is a Sunday, and it is our district missions rally uh, leading into our district conference, which will be held here. And um, on that Sunday night, uh, churches from all across Western PA will be gathered here, and we encourage you to plan to come and to be a part of that service. But the theme of that service that night is we want them all. Dennis Jackson is the director of global partners for the Wesleyan Church, head of our mission outreach around the world. He is going to be our speaker. Um, our district mission director is, is Richard Cox, who served here on staff. And he has asked that the churches across our district would, would focus in on these next several Sundays in calling or bringing our, our, our minds to the fact that we are a called people, that God has called us, that he wants you and me to be a part of what he is all about. And so we're going to look at different aspects of the call. This morning we are going to look at a call to seek. We are called to seek. Look at this uh, video, and at first you'll probably think there's no connection to what we just said, but hold in, hang in there. Yeah, at first I thought it was just the stress of moving. <laughs> hey, I was using that. Think we own stock in the electric company? I will turn this car around right now. There's nobody back there. I was becoming my father. <clears throat> it's been an adjustment, but we're making it work. You know, Progressive.com makes it easy for us to get the right home insurance. Progressive can't protect you from becoming your parents, but we can protect your home and auto. You ever thought you'd become your parent? Those of you who have children know what I'm talking about. Your child comes home from school and asks, Hey, Mom and Dad, I, I, I want to go over to so-and-so's house. They've invited me to come over. And even though you told yourself you'd never be like your mom or dad, the interrogation begins. And where do they live? Um, what are they like? Who are their parents? Well, who are their friends? And on and on you go, trying to figure out whether this kid or this family is worthy of your children. And after you they give you all the information that you can wring out of them. You lock yourself in the bathroom and you get out your tablet and you're trolling those parents and that kid on Facebook to see just what the connections are, whether you got all the information. Uh, and when you have children, you always want to make sure that they hang out with the right people. You don't want anyone messing up the perfect parenting job that you have done up until that point. So you scrutinize every bit of information that you can get your hands on. Every friend that enters into their life, you try to be the gatekeeper. And you have your impressions that you get from the times that maybe you get to interact with that friend and you watch them interact with your children and you mix in the comments that you hear from the other parents that you're getting a little bit of information out of. We don't want them to hang around with kids who may lead them down into darkness or where our kids will do something or just be there when bad things happen. We want our kids to hang out with good people, with nice people, with people that, that respect others, that they're considerate, they're fun, they make good choices, they don't swear and drink and do drugs. And yet we want them to enjoy life but we want them to be smart with their decisions about who they hang with. Now this works well in our role as parenting. And it should be how we care about our kids. But many times we carry that same mindset, that same MO, over into our role as a Christ follower. And we look at the world and the people around us and those that we want to contact and maybe even invite to church and we want to vet them. Let's look this morning at how carefully Jesus 
vetted those that he called to follow him. In Matthew chapter 9, we read this story. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and others dis, uh, disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people do not need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. We want to look at several things in this passage. One thing this passage reveals, it reveals the heart of Jesus Christ. The heart about, uh, about what he was really all about. Remember what Jesus was doing here, where he was in, 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 in the minis his ministry. He was in the process of finding some guys that he could hang out with for the next three years and into whom he was going to pour himself and his, his, his message so that when he was gone, these men would carry the good news and share it to the four corners of the earth. And so he comes across this tax collector named Matthew. And he stops and he engages him in conversation. And before we can stop him, Jesus offers Matthew a spot on the team. Follow me and be my disciple. Now if we had been there that day, no doubt we would have quickly looked up and see who Jesus was about to talk to, and we would have immediately got out and got on Facebook and got on LinkedIn, find out this guy and who he was and what he was, uh, and we would have found out uh, that this was not a character that we wanted the new Messiah to have anything to do with. He would taint his character and his message uh, and, and maybe ruin everything. And we would have offered Jesus our advice. Now, Jesus, I know you grew up in a carpenter's shop, so you really don't understand what's going on here. But do you know that this guy is a tax collector? Do you understand what that means, Jesus? The Romans occupy our country, and they have convinced some of our brothers, Jews, to, to collaborate with them. And, and they collect taxes for those hated Roman occupiers. And not only do they collect taxes for them, but they inflate the price of the tax uh, and they skim off the difference for themselves. They are rich men, but they are rich on the backs of us. Everyone would like to take any one of them out behind the barn and beat them to within an inch of their lives. Uh, but they have the protection of the Roman armies. Uh, and so Jesus, Matthew, is nothing but a paid thief. You definitely are not going to get much traction with your ministry in this environment uh, if, you, if you choose to hang with guys like this. But Jesus was not hindered uh, by Matthew's past. Ignoring our protest, Jesus calls Matthew without hesitation. He knew full well that Matthew's heart was full of sin, deceit, greed, his disdain for anything righteous, Matthew's story didn't scare Jesus away from reaching out and calling him to come and walk with him. Jesus was more concerned uh, about whether or not Matthew would say yes than anything about his past. When everyone looked at Matthew, they didn't see a man. They saw a tax collector. They saw a sinner. They saw a despicable person. And they didn't want to be anywhere near him. 
or to be associated with him. But what did Jesus see when he saw Matthew Matthew, there at his tax collecting booth that day? Yes, Jesus saw a sinner. He saw one who was lost. He saw a man, and a man who was lost. He saw also in that fallen man great potential. He saw a man that he could use to write one of the Gospels that would be a part of God's story so that the world would know who this Jesus really was. You see, Jesus is not hindered by the, what he sees, or by the opinions of others. In Jesus' time, the Romans had conquered uh, everything. They ruled supreme. They, they ruled with an iron fist. They were in control. And in the land of Israel, the land of the Jews, the land that God had given to them, they ruled. And King Herod the Great, who was a puppet of Rome, built the port city of Caesarea. And he built it to honor the Roman Caesar, Augustus. When you landed in Caesarea, the first thing that you saw was this huge temple that he had built to worship the emperor, who was considered a Roman god. This was the culture that had seeped into the land of the Jews, Uh, And the Jewish people reacted to this pagan culture imposed upon them by creating a group of people that were actually known as the separated ones. These people wanted to keep their hearts separate from Rome and its impact upon them of Rome and their gods. Uh, God had commanded them, thou shalt have no other gods do not make statues and bow down to them. And so they, they were separated from anything that would taint them. These Jews, these separated ones, certain, there were certain cleanliness practices that included only eating certain things. Uh, there were unclean things and clean things, and you had nothing to do with those unclean foods. Uh. But they came to believe that there were also clean people and unclean people. And the Romans definitely were unclean. And those who colluded with them were unclean. And the separated ones maintained their cleanliness by staying away from uh, those who were unclean. As you read through the Gospels, you're not going to find the term separated ones. But you will find uh, a word that you have heard, and that word is Pharisee. The word Pharisees means separated ones. And these were the ones that they separated themselves. They were so intent on keeping clean and keeping free from anybody that they thought were tainted. They were determined not to take part in any of the Roman practices or associate with anyone that did. They wanted hearts that were separated from Rome and totally in their minds, to God. And in many ways, we can appreciate uh, what they were trying to accomplish or the, the, the underlying truth there. And so as we watch Jesus that day, stopping and engaging Matthew in conversation, and then at Jesus' invitation, we see Matthew get up and leave his booth and get in place. He's going to be one of Jesus's Twelve disciples. Jesus picks a tax collector, a, a, a stooge uh, of Rome, uh, a despicable, unclean outcast, to be one of the twelve that would join him on the journey, that would eat with him, that would sit with him, that would minister with him, that would sit at his feet uh, and listen and learn. Jesus picks a, a, a tax collector. The Pharisees certainly wouldn't approve of that. They wouldn't let their kids play with the tax collector kid. The Pharisees didn't approve of what Jesus just did. And, and, and they became even more concerned when Matthew decided to have a cookout and, and have Jesus come over to meet all of his friends. 
And the only friends that Matthew had were other tax collectors, other sinners, uh, other outcasts, prostitutes, drunkards, those that were not wanted in respectable Jewish society. And so the Pharisees, uh, they're standing over in the neighbor's yard looking over the fence at all that is going on. Uh, and, and, and here is Jesus and his disciples with all the sinners in town. Uh, and so they, they sidle over to, the, to, the, to a couple of Jesus' disciples and, and they ask him, why does your teacher eat with such scum? But Jesus was close enough that he overheard the conversation and he jumps in and answers the question. And his answer there is, there, there's three parts that we want to bring to your attention. The first part of his response has to do with health. He says, when Jesus, when Jesus um, heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. He, Jesus was speaking about health. Spiritual health, he was talking about. We might have expected him to turn on the Pharisees and lambast them and say, you judgmental people, how dare you judge these men? You should accept them. You should love them. But Jesus just says, listen, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Basically, he was saying, that's why I'm here. Jesus was acknowledging that, that, that this group of people, Matthew and his friends, were not healthy. He knew who they were. He knew they were tax collectors. He knew that they robbed the people of this community. He knew that there were fathers that worked hard and weren't able to do for their children because Matthew and his, his ilk were raking off all the hard-earned hard earned um, labor of this community. He knew their work was selfish. But he said that it's precisely the sick who need a doctor. And then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy and not, uh, and not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Jesus was trying to help them to understand mercy. I want you to show mercy, not, not sacrifices. He gave the, the Pharisees a, a homework assignment. He said, I want you to go and look up this scripture. They, they knew their scripture. They, they memorized vast parts of, of the Old Testament. They knew what Jesus was taught. He said, go look it up, study it, do some research. It comes from the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. In the day of Hosea, the people of Israel were very heavy on religious tra tradition and very short uh, on showing mercy to anyone that didn't measure up. They went to the temple. They offered all kinds of sacrifices uh, to the Lord God. Uh, and, and, and yet they showed no mercy to anyone around them that just needed maybe a second chance. And Jesus was saying that God would rather that they show kindness than get every ritual right. He was saying that it is great, as great as it is to go to church on Sunday morning, to become a member, to get involved in a small group, and to help out on family fun day, as good as all that is, it's meaningless if we walk by that sinner at work and never show love to them, and never share the good news of Jesus Christ with them, that Jesus Christ died for their sins. Third part of Jesus' response had to do with his mission. It says, For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. What Jesus was saying, look around here at Matthew's cookout. You see, all these, you see all these sinners? That's the reason I came into this world. If Jesus was looking to fill 12 slots in his circle of disciples, the Pharisees were saying, we can get you 12 guys. We, we have more than that down at the Pharisee school of 
theology down in the middle of Jerusalem right next to our temple. We can get you 12 wonderful guys that know the scripture. And if we were helping Jesus trying to pick 12 guys that would really be the ones who take the message to the world, that's probably where we would have started. Find someone that really seems to have a heart for the scriptures and and that's the person that would be ideal. But Jesus was making a statement. He was saying this, if you want to be one of Jesus' followers, there's one prerequisite. And that is you've got to know that you are a sinner that needs saved. If we don't start there, we're never going to be a part of what God wants to do. What, God is, what Jesus was exposing here, it was what the Pharisees didn't see, and that was that everybody needs to be rescued. Everyone is lost uh, until they find Jesus. The tax collectors might have had a, parent, uh, a propensity toward the sin of greed, and they were willing to lose their reputation in their community for the sake of money. It was their drug of choice. But the Pharisees' temptation was self-righteousness and arrogance. And both groups needed saving. Both of them were flawed. When Jesus tells the Pharisees that his mission is to call sinners, he is inviting them to join him on that mission. Okay, guys, you know the scripture. Go look at what God says. Join me in this. Be a part of it. That's what he is doing. And they should have been the ones that got it. They should have been the ones when he laid out the the truth that say, yes, the Messiah has come. Let's go reach the world. But the sad thing is it went right over their heads. They're not sinners. They are the separated ones. It was all sacrifice with no mercy. Jesus in doing this was not saying that he approved of what the tax collectors did. But he does go to their cookout because he loves them and he wants to rescue them. And the only way that you can do that is to rub shoulders with them. Jesus is showing his heart to the Pharisees and he's showing his heart to the tax collectors and to those other sinners at the cookout. And he's showing his heart to those disciples who were standing there still wondering, who is this man that called me to follow him? They are going to carry on the mission of Jesus after he is gone. And they're beginning to see the heart of God that has a passion for those that are lost around them. Later in Matthew, Jesus told this parable. He said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. God is the one that is out there searching for that one lost sheep. And we need to understand that each of us are, at some point, that one lost sheep that Jesus sought and in which he invited to be a part of his team. And he says, follow me and be my disciple. We all need relationship with God. And God wants relationship with us. Peter reminds us, he says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And so he comes over and over and time after time when maybe we would have cut people off right away and say, look what they did. They don't deserve God's grace. And God says, no, I'm still seeking God does not want anyone to die without a relationship with him. He wants you and I to know him. But he wants us to do more than just know him. He wants us to really know him, 
to really have relationship with him. A relationship that is so intense that our old sinner's heart begins to beat with the very heart of Jesus. That my heart that was full of sin begins to beat in a different pattern that reflects the mercy and grace of God who saves us from our sins. The heart of Jesus is to eat, to hang out, to talk with, to touch sinners. Not just so that he could kick back and have a good time and not be in with those stiff Pharisees. No, his heart that day was breaking for the lostness of Matthews and his friends to the point that he was more concerned about reaching them than about his reputation, about what the Pharisees or anybody else in town thought. These people were lost, and he was going to do his best to reach them. He didn't allow the misjudgment of these important people to restrain him from seeking these lost. He was not afraid of associating with sinners. He actually went to the cookout with them. We need to be concerned as parents of who our kids' friends are, who's pouring into their lives. But as Christ's followers... Jesus is calling us to join him as he did Matthew, to follow me and to be my disciple, to follow me in my heart for the world, to follow me and see the need, the loss that are all around us if we just open our eyes. And that is a call to live a life unhindered. Unhindered by our pride, unhindered by hypocrisy, unhindered by judging others, unhindered by what others may think. Jesus is calling us. Jesus is calling me. We who need him so much, he's calling us to be a part. The Pharisee says, he says, as the Pharisees look at people, they say, change, and you might be allowed to join us. But Jesus looks at sinners and he says, follow me and you'll be changed. We look at people and it's hard to imagine sometimes what the potential is, what the possibilities are. He is calling us who were lost to join him in seeking the lost. I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but some here have been a Christian a long time. Some, if we can hardly remember back to when we weren't a Christian, but if we remember back to who we were, probably we wouldn't want everybody to really know the sinner that we were. And yet somehow God saw within us something and someone that he wanted to save and salvage and redeem and make, make a part of his team. There are people in your life that God wants to redeem. And he's calling us to see each person around us through Jesus' eyes. To see them as a future Christ follower who could change the world. Just like Jesus saw in Matthew, the tax collector, the writer of the next gospel. That would change the world. Seeking goes both ways. For Jesus, there's no barriers that are going to keep him from seeking the lost. And he's calling you and I to join him on mission, to seek past the barriers that keep me from seeing those around me as lost, uh, or seeing them as a future fellow Christian, as seeing them with the potential to change the world for Christ. If you go from here with anything, I want you to go with this. What does God want to do with the worst sinner you know? What does God want to do with the worst sinner you know? I'm sure right now 
there are some names going through your mind. Some people that, you know, that is a sinner. That is a bad person. That is a person that I just don't know. Can't ever see them sitting in church. The roof would fall in if they came. What does God want to do with that person? Because that's the person that he loves. That's the person, the kind of people that he went to. And sometimes we're only looking for someone that would kind of, if we're not careful, kind of add to our little group and make it look better, give it you know, better connection. I don't know, but sometimes we are selective in who we want to put our arms around. Who is the worst sinner you know, and what does God want to do with them? Jesus is seeking seekers to join him on mission. Jesus is seeking people who are really seeking him, and will join him in seeking others. Will you join him in seeking to save those who are lost around you? Listen, this is not, this is certainly my job as a pastor, but it's not just my job. My job is, is to those in my connection. You know people that I have no idea who they are. I go to Walmart and I see them and I have no idea who they are. You know them. You know who they are, their name, their, their family connections, and all the things they've ever done. God loves that person. Do you? Will you ask him to bring down the barriers? And to realize that he's calling you to not just follow him, but to follow him in mission. To follow him to pick up where he left off. Jesus is not here walking the earth anymore. It's you and me, just as he left the job to his disciples for us. This is our generation. And we are the only generation, the only people that will reach this generation. If we don't reach this generation, they're lost. They're going to hell. You know, 50 years from now, it won't be wonderful to have a revival because many of them are going to be dead. Who is the worst sinner you know? And what does Jesus want to do with them? I ask you to go and pray that out to the point where maybe you're weak for that soul and ask God to show you ways to make a bridge that they can walk over and meet Jesus. Shall we stand? Father God, not only is it amazing that you would choose us to save us, but then to think that you would choose us to be on mission with you. It's one thing to just have walked by Matthew's booth and to reach out and, and say, Matthew, I forgive you, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. And to walk on and leave him there it's another thing to say, Matthew, I want, to be, I want you to be part of the team. I, wa I want you to be one of the 12. And Lord, so many times we can look at people and say they need Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if they found Jesus? But we just kind of go on and never put our arms around them, never love them to you. Lord, I pray that this week you would show us those people that we have overlooked. I pray you would show us those people that don't know about Jesus even though they know us. I pray you would forgive us for our sins of selfishness and arrogance. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to be your hands and feet, to be your voice, to share Jesus with those we know and to share him with Maybe the person that we think is farthest from you who has no hope of turning his life around. Lord, help us to love like Jesus. We ask these things in your name. Amen.